welcome. All right, so we're trying something a little new and it's a modern technology and all its marvels here. So um, I'm Eric Hansen and welcome to our um, biannual uh, Grand Round on ethics. And today we welcome Nathaniel Gebhardt who's actually joining us from Tanzania and we'll be leading the discussion um, remotely via Zoom. Um, and then we have Dr. Uh, Jay Jacobson here with us in person. And so we're going to be doing a little bit of a combined remote and uh, in-person presentation here on ethics and global ophthalmology. So um, I don't know if uh, all of you have met Dr. Gebhard, but he is a, uh, on faculty at OHSU. And he's also um, been our global fellow this year, traveling around extensively um, and working with our partners internationally. And then Dr. Jay Jacobson, um, if you've been around, you know him well. He is a professor emeritus of infectious disease as well as medical ethics and has been um, a real stalwart partner in our um, you know, conversations around ethics here in Moran. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and give it over to uh, Nathan first. And then uh, uh, I think if you're here, I can advance the slides with this and it should work, okay? So if, um, if uh, you need to advance and I'm not doing it, just pop, pop me on the head. Nathan, you should be able to see. Thank you, Eric. Awesome. Can you guys hear me, Eric? Yes, Nate. All right, thank you. Uh, it's great to be co-presenting with Jay and Eric this morning. Um, Mambo from Tanzania. Hopefully the connectivity isn't an issue today. Um, but I'm very excited to be a part of this discussion today. Hopefully we can all learn a lot from each other. Uh, when Jay and I were discussing our objectives for uh, our ethics grand rounds, we thought of three main points that we, uh, or goals that we wanted to um, achieve. One was generate thoughtful discussion on medical ethics, especially uh, within global ophthalmology. Two, uh, share and learn from one another's experiences, encountering global um, ophthalmology uh, ethics questions or dilemmas. And three, gain more awareness about the AAO's ethical principles and rules. So um, as I was thinking about this, um, I've thought a lot about uh, the experiences I've had this year as Moran's Global Ophthalmology Fellow. And a couple of anecdotes came to mind. And hopefully um, this morning we can uh, share experiences and stories from our own uh, global health work um, I'd love to, to hear your stories and anecdotes um, about problems, yes. uh, ethical dilemmas, and, and things of that nature that you've encountered. But anyway, just to get us started, I wanted to share two uh, quick anecdotes with you um, that really got me thinking about ethical problems in global ophthalmology. Um, and I'm sorry, I apologize for the background noise. Um, hopefully it's not too distracting. I'm at Hotel Tilapia, the only place that has good Wi-Fi here in Monza. So uh, the first little anecdote was uh, when I first started my SICS training um, earlier this year at Silganga in Kathmandu, um, I was of course doing everything I could to be an ethical ophthalmologist, um, working within uh, their training framework and just uh, learning SICS one step at a time with my mentors. Uh, but one thing that uh, I didn't realize was that I was, my being there was having some Unintended, un unintended consequences and um, ripple effects that I, I couldn't have foreseen. So oftentimes we'd have cases that were scheduled for me. Uh, and But if there was no case scheduled for me, I'd just be observing uh, the other surgeons doing their SICS cases. But occasionally they would uh, bring me into room and say, oh, hey, we found a case for you. Um, let's go ahead and do this uh, case together. And I, of course, was really excited to do more cataract surgery cases. So I, of course, would agree. And uh, this happened a few times. And then eventually, I came to find out that they were taking uh, some of the residents' uh, SICS training cases and giving them to me, the visiting global ophthalmology fellow. And of course, um, that, that really bothered me. And I asked them not to, not to do that anymore. 
uh, but um, it really got me thinking about um, the fact that even if we're trying to act ethically towards our patients um, and individuals, um, are our actions having unintended consequences on systems or on other physicians? So uh, that's a problem in global ophthalmology that I, that I, in global ophthalmology that I don't necessarily have a good answer for, but it's something I've been thinking um, a lot about. And then uh, the second anecdote I wanted to share with you all was, uh, as I've been working here in Tanzania, I've encountered the situation a lot, how uh, we'll be seeing patients in clinic and patients will specifically say uh, that they want the Mzungu uh, doctor to do their cataract surgery. And it's got me thinking a lot about um, the idea of my presence here, perhaps undermining patient confidence in the local doctors and their ability to take care of their own patients. Of course, when a patient says that to me, I usually counter that um, I actually hear as a term of time and still change um, from the, uh, So I, I present uh, um, the, the teacher, but it, it made me think a lot about uh, with realism mindset or actions that Push on modern uh, technology. Do you guys have someone reading? Um, we can hear you again. Sorry, what did you say? Uh, <laughs> I think we'll just go to the, the cases. That sounds good. I'm sorry if I cut out. Yeah, let's try to go uh, case one. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead with those, and I want you to either signal by uh, raising the icon for your hand or just sort of step in uh, if you want to add things or um, a comment on what we're doing, Nate. So um, I let the audience... Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, Nate has uh, shared, of course, a story about his own experience and he's brought a couple of cases from the American Academy, which has its own um, resource uh, collection about ethics. So this is the first one. And as you can see, there's an ophthalmologist, Dr. Z, uh, and you can read that uh, he hasn't performed uh, surgery for about five years. Uh, we're not told how many years he did do surgery before that, and he wishes to start operating again. And he's heard that there's a good place to practice uh, ophthalmologic surgery in another country. Next slide. So um, he's in touch with a surgical instrument company uh, looking for a sponsor and they agree he visits and uh, when the program in the country he visits asks about his experience, he states uh, something we didn't know before that he's been operating uh, for over 10 years, but you'd recall that there's been an interruption uh, over about the last five. 
Uh, the company agrees to sponsor the visit, but it's contingent on his use of a new instrument, which has not yet been approved in the country uh, that he's going to visit. So he arrives and immediately starts to operate on patients who have advanced cataracts. Next slide. So he's there about a week and performs 50 surgeries. And um, these are the things that did not happen. So he didn't do a pre-op or post-op assessments, uh, did not secure informed consent. Uh, there was no post-operative assessment by another health provider and his surgery was not supervised uh, by an ophthalmology colleague or other provider skilled in cataract surgery. Next slide. So he gets home and wishes to publish his outcomes using the sponsoring uh, company's equipment. He does publish his results and presents case studies uh, using patient names and testimonials about how Dr. Z helped them. And he's then paid as a consultant for the surgical company. Next slide. So I, what I'll tell you is that Nate and I sort of collectively decided and Eric to use that case and I would just share with you, acknowledging that it comes from um, the AOA, it's pretty egregious. I, I think that Nate used those terms. So the first thing to say is that I think in clinical practice, it's pretty rare that we encounter a situation where the healthcare provider has, shall I say, consciously broken so many rules. And so this case, I think, is worth thinking about in a couple of ways, because time is short, one of the things it does is condense uh, all of those things for us. We get a chance to see them. Uh, they are all rules that your academy has developed, but I, I think it would be naive to imagine someone actually breaking them all. So this is not a hard case in the sense of trying to decide if a rule is broken, but let's go ahead and run that a bit, and then we'll kind of back up a step and think about where do these rules come from? And in a more complicated case, how do we decide if the behavior is appropriate or not? So why don't you tell us uh, what ethical violations uh, Dr. Z has committed, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally? And that might be a great thing for you to comment on, whether you think that he is in fact acting willfully, or could you imagine that he's acting unintentionally and for Nate, it would be great if you just share your name uh, before your comment. Uh, so that's the question. What violations may, uh, uh, may he have committed? I'm gonna help you, Jay. Can you guys hear me now, by the way? Yes. That's much better, Nate. Sorry. Uh, we're just looking for some comments. Uh, Randy has one. <clears throat> well, there's so many, it's, it's, it's hard to get started, but uh, the fact that uh, he, he clearly uh, needed to increase his skills, so uh, it was decided he would do it at the expense of uh, people who uh, don't have the ability to help. And um, I, I would submit, because I know exactly scenarios like this, that the compensation rate under these circumstances is probably horrendous. Uh, so there's a huge price that was paid on these people being essentially experimented or trained on that uh, he was being paid for, for uh, doing this and that uh, a company that was involved uh, was essentially supporting this uh, fraud in, in order to get experience uh, in the country and area, and, and likely indeed, these uh, patients, if the one I think of was so very similar to this, were very poorly screened. Uh, likely they all had dense cataracts, but many, many likely also had no light perception or had no ability to have return of vision. And, uh, uh, and I'm using their name. I mean, almost every step of these would, would be an ethical violation. I think the hard discussion would be when we, when we get into a zone where it, it's the only way people would get provision of care and was appropriately done, could there be a positive? And there's a, there's a variation on this when you're ready, I'd like to get to, is in which there are groups 
and, and the one I think particular in India that literally make money out of doing this. They, they charge people who have uh, lost their surgical privileges or have been told that they shouldn't be doing surgery, who will charge people a horrendous amount of money to come and, and practice on charity patients so that they can try to, to get a skill set that's better. Uh, one I know in particular is India, so that they can hopefully reverse and be able to maintain their surgical skills. That happen still. I can tell exactly who you can contact and uh, they charge for a week, as I remember, it's about $15,000 to, to go and be able to operate on a, on a group of patients, uh, often without supervision, sometimes with supervision, as a, as a very significant money-making operation for the people. <laughs> So Nate, I'm sure you heard that, and I appreciate uh, um, Randy's comment. Um, he's introduced the idea of money, which interestingly doesn't feature very prominently in the usual principles that we think about in terms of medical ethics. But clearly, it's a motivator. It's an incentive that can be very powerful. And uh, in this particular case, if you think about it, money may be behind many of the actions that were taken and the violations that we're seeing. So we'll, we'll come back and talk a little bit about that uh, because for example, in our society, uh, making money is often seen as a good. We recognize that it's a motivator, but let's just use the corporate example. The test of good performance is often about making money much more than about what actions are taken. So let's keep that in mind. And I think uh, Randy's comment in many ways covers several things. If you think about what he said and what he was concerned about, I think he used the word fraud. So that may have to do with the lack of transparency. And I'd be interested in knowing whether the rest of you think that fraud was one of the violations here. And also, I think Nate, um, in our conversations, asked, what's the most egregious thing that you think? Dr. Z did or violated, because as you can see on this slide, he violated all of those rules that are listed. Which one is the most troubling to some of you? I'm gonna just collect a couple others, Randy, if I may. Yeah, uh, please give your, also please give your name so Nate can hear who's commenting. Why don't you go ahead? I'll, I'll get both of you, you first. Yes, please. And, you know, I don't know that any particular um, rule stick, sticks out to me to be the most egregious, but it's the overarching attitude. You know, there's, there's such a condescending approach and a self-serving uh, attitude here that he's getting corporate sponsors. He, he looks at this as an opportunity with no negative repercussions to himself. In fact, he probably is doing a lot of harm to some of these patients. Not, not giving them full consent. All of that speaks to this attitude and just it's entirely self-serving. It's just so dangerous. And so I think it's that's the thing that's most egregious to me. So I uh, I believe Nate heard you and we heard you. And uh, Nate provided a handout of this extensive list of rules that comes from the academy. And interestingly, it says um, on number two, an ophthalmologist's responsibility is to always act in the best interest of the patient. So if you think about it, that's one rule. In many ways, it's the rule you're referring to as very disturbing because in our world, we all have multiple interests at the same time. But it's fascinating that number two on the list of a lot of rules is to put the patient's best interest first. And we'll see if anyone disagrees with you but I think a lot of his actions could be under that umbrella that he's putting his own interests first. And I remind you that that rule exists for many other people. We actually expect them when you buy a used car. The used car salesman is pretty clearly, I would say, putting his or her interest first. And that's acceptable within that field. So we'll keep track of that. Anyone else that actually there was another hint previously about a, a violation or an egregious one here? Can I collect that? There it was on the left. Yes. Uh, Tyler uh, Etheridge. Um, I, I think the morally the moral licensing that he performed to try to convince himself that he was somehow acting ethically 
is the most egregious thing that he did. Uh, would you repeat that just even for me to hear a little better? What was the rationale or the... the... Oh, the, the moral licensing. So he, he presumably convinced himself that he was acting ethically by what he did. And I think that was the most egregious thing that he did. Fill that out a little bit. That actually goes back to that idea of intention that we talked about. So there could be two kinds of intention, right? The intention was, I know these rules. I'm going to break all of them, and I'm, uh, you know, and I know that that's fine. Another one might be that either I misunderstand the rule, or I know another rule, and I'm acting in concert with that ethically. What do you think is going on? Yeah, I think. I don't know what's going through his head, but it seems like how egregious those, how egregiously he broke those ethical principles that he presumably knew as a physician and grew up in as a physician, that at some point in time, he had to, had to essentially convince himself that what he was doing was right. And there was some benefit to either the patient or himself or others. And he fell down that rabbit hole of convincing himself that he was doing something that was appropriate. And so when you're judging a moral act, is it, is it the intention or is it the action? And for him, the action was amoral, but the intention may have also been amoral, but he could have convinced himself the other way. So. Let me just see if Nate has a comment back on that. So just a quick summary, and it's very, very important, is that your, I'm going to call it an assumption, you may be right, was that he did what he did with the personal belief that what he did was ethical. And we haven't really heard what his argument was for that, but that's a little different than someone who does what they do knowing it's wrong. Let's just be really clear. Randy used the word fraud earlier. There are people who defraud, but they do it very stealthily because they know it's wrong and they're actually afraid of being accountable for doing the wrong thing. So let me just check with Nate. Nate, any follow-up comments on, on those comments? Thank you, Jay. Um, and can you hear me still? I'm, I'm yes, so sorry. I just I a little bit. Out earlier. I'm not sure at what point. I'm not sure at what point I uh, was lost, but um, that's a great comment. I, I think that raises a great great question um, whether our ethics are determined by our intentions or motivations or whether uh, they are determined by the actions and it's going to go into a broader discussion about um, the foundation and philosophical rules of ethics in a little bit more detail but that's a really good point that Tyler made yeah. Uh, thank you, Nate. And just so you know, uh, I think we got the gist of what you're saying, but there's still a little bit of an interruption in the audio. So I'm gathering that what Nate had to say, and I would affirm, is what you said is very, very important. But it's important to know how we should judge things. Is Does it matter what the intent is? For example, could we excuse uh, this ophthalmologist for a couple of reasons? Uh, let's just start with the first one. Let's say he didn't know the rules, that he hadn't read the material from the academy and the handout that you have today. What would be your judgment at that point? So we'll call that ignorance of the rule. So his intent was his own best guess of what was the right thing to do. He didn't recognize that anything that he was doing ran outside his own judgment. Of, uh, for example, let's say he was rationalizing that his 10 years of surgery was a lot of experience, and that that might have been more experience than some of his younger colleagues in a developing country. And so his rationale was, I have more experience than they do. I'm just brushing up. Um, what do you think about would it justify what he did? Yes. But the thing that and Trump, give your name. Bob Hoffman. Yes. Uh, when we send people on outreach trips for Moran, they don't do things surgically in developing countries that they do not do regularly at home. Basic principle, setting aside the academy's, you know, code of ethics. The thing that troubles me most with this is this issue of 
I'm going to go do this and it's okay because it's in a developing country. And I have seen this with attending physicians, other programs. I've also seen it in residency training programs. And I've been doing international work for the last 25 years. And one program I work with would send residents to what would be an outreach setting for them to do unsupervised surgery, supervised by inadequately trained residents. I have as much trouble with that. But this, the thing that bothers me is that this individual is doing things that are not regularly part of the fabric of what he does day in and day out here. And I think that should be the thing that drives it. Um, so again, uh, Nate, I hope you heard that. It's a very helpful comment, but let's think about the question of, did he know the rules? Given your comment, I don't doubt that your residents do know the rules before they go. You yes. share that, you <laughs> set their expectation. Your comment is especially valuable because you declared not only that there are physicians who do that without following those rules, but there are even other training programs that may do that. So I guess one of the questions, and, and I invite you to think about that, you would be upset, I think, if residents in your own program found a way to do unsupervised procedures while they were in a developing country. But if another program sent residents to do that knowingly, would who would you judge as breaking the rules? Would you be judging the resident as acting unethically or the program? I get your comment well, first. And we'll yeah, yeah. No, I, I would hold the program and the individual supervising the residents accountable. The residents are just doing what they're asked, and they try to get trained by whatever means possible. The program I mentioned, the only surgical experience those residents got doing the minimum number of cataract surgeries they did was in these outlying areas, which perpetuated a training program that was not adequate. So I, I really appreciate that. And we should recall that Dr. Z in this case is not a resident. And one of the questions might be, where, where do we learn what the rules are? And we won't take more time on that because you already know some of the answers. The answers to the rule questions in your handout, they're very accessible. And some of them, I think we learn by example, but not by written text, right? So if you train in a program, where everyone around you is following these rules, it's understandable that you might come to believe that those are the rules. So just to draw a contrast for a moment, and maybe we have someone at the table or on Zoom from the private practice community, once they leave training, they may not see those models of behavior and the rules change in medical ethics. So someone who hasn't been doing things for a while might not be as familiar with the rules. I'm going to just leave it there and let you think about that. How important is it that this doctor knew the rules versus is it even conceivable uh, that he didn't and did all those behaviors? So on um, Nate's slide, he's inviting you to answer the question, uh, have you witnessed or encountered an ethical dilemma, anything like this or different in doing global health work? And Randy's already shared one story and in fact, you know as well, that is another program. Is there a different experience that somebody has encountered doing global epidemiology that troubled you as maybe being an ethical problem? Uh, let's see, behind Randy, do I see? Yes, and then we'll go to Randy. Yes, please. Uh, I can hey, say your name. Jeff Petty, hi, Nate. Oh, thanks, thanks for doing this. Hope you're well. Uh, I would say, Daily, on, on kind of an hour to hour, half day by half day basis, you are faced with these type of uh, situations. You know, it's really nice and simple to start with an example where you just throw the whole kitchen sink of you know, egregious actions to start with. Uh, but the reality is, is much messier. And, and in general, you have extremely well intentioned people willing to give their time, the resources, et cetera come and help, right? They've got a tool, which is surgery or a skill, and there's a need. But once you were there, for the period of, of ethical levels that you're faced, uh, one specific example, um, 
were in place. There's a young child, you know, less than a year old, and bilateral white cataracts. You can just even ophthalmology infrastructure. Uh, if you don't operate, they will definitely be blind. And if you do operate, they in all likelihood are going to be blind because they don't wouldn't have the follow-up, the contact lenses, etc. And yet, like you're looking into the face of parents and you know this this child, knowing that technically you can do it, and you might even have a safe ecosystem with you know within the hospital to do it. But you, you are now faced with a situation you never could have imagined. And that I would say is the rule that, that it very much is, you know, at least two to three times a day, you're faced with something that you just couldn't have anticipated. You wouldn't have necessarily read something directly applicable to it. And now you're left to navigate based on what, you know, your own kind of moral compass, what your code of ethics is all in the face of, you know, you've got patients sitting in front of you right at that moment. Um, I just sort of underlined some of Jeff's comments. Um, several of them are so important. Um, we'll talk a little bit, if we can, about solutions. That is, I think we can agree there are lots of problems, ethical issues that arise in global ophthalmology. And the question, I mean, there are a couple of questions that are layered. One is, is this particular doctor's action uh, breaking one or more rules? And we have the rules in front of us, and we can usually answer that question. We are struggling with his intention. And so just to answer an earlier question about how you decide where intention is, uh, it's a choice. Uh, for example, in law, there's a big difference between first degree murder and manslaughter. And it's very much predicated on intention. Philosophers, especially Aristotle, who's written a lot about ethics, argues that intention is almost always close to impossible to determine. That is, if you ask me my intention, I can say lots of things to you, primarily designed to serve my self-interest, but you would have a hard time knowing whether that's true or not. Think about a crime and trying to understand the intention. It's really hard. Aristotle would argue that it's the consequence of the action that makes something wrong or right and not the intention. Other people may disagree, but that's partly an answer to one of the earlier comments about what do we do about intention. Um, Jeff's last comment, I think, Nate, I'd invite you to weigh in a little bit, because I think he may have offered us as many as three ways of thinking about what's right. You could go right to the rules. You might go to other rules, right? People who are religious have no trouble finding a set of rules that guide behavior. And he also used the word, you might use your personal moral compass. So I think that's a great thing to think about, even in the case of Dr. Z. But Nate, what do you think about solving some of the problems, which as Jeff pointed out, are not as straightforward as some of the rules that we shared here today are? How would you suggest to people they think about meeting uh, some of those ethical challenges? Jay, I got off as we logged back on, so I didn't hear the question. Can you read the question for me? Uh, very briefly, we've been talking, uh, first people have shared personal experiences, and then they've talked a little bit about the fact that these problems are quite common in global epidemiology, including some that are, are not listed in the rules. So they pose very challenging questions about what do we do when we feel uh, that there's one of these problems. Do you have some thoughts from your experience coming back to us about what strategies uh, you might recommend for a resident who goes very often, uh, a practicing ophthalmologist, a faculty member? Go ahead. I Maybe Eric can channel things. Well, I was going to have a, yeah, I'd actually, I'd like to first offer um, a comment from the chat. Um, so Dr. Chaya said, you know, responsibility to the biological principles of uh, patient autonomy and beneficence by not participating in consent and not being supervised by a preceptor or an experienced surgeon. I think before solutions, I, I was wanting to piggyback off something Jay said. 
a lot of the conversation has been with the ignorance of rules as being an immoral act. But I think what he was getting to with the, uh, intention versus consequence is there's also an ignorance of outcome. I think that's where we hugely failed as uh, a global health or a national development community for a long time. And we're trying to re, uh, rewrite that ship. And so one way, to, you know, with this, just like kind of laid out very uh, straightforward uh, actions that violate rules, it becomes easy. But when you start thinking about the subtlety, so much of this actually happens in much more nuanced ways, even now, even amongst partners we probably respect and work with. I think it's important to acknowledge that, that um, so, and then taking that, if Dr. Z's actions here, which seems so egregious to us, had a better outcome. What if what the consequence of his trip in a year or two year was the development of an institution and its rise because of the sponsorship. The patients actually got care and they, they turned out well despite his inadequacies. Was that a better moral act or ethical act than somebody who went with all the intention and the you know abidance by the rules? And maybe the outcomes weren't quite as good. How would you how would you characterize that? <laughs> So I, I would just sort of bank what Eric said because he's kind of pre-visioned, if I can use that word, something that we'll talk about. So we've talked about a conflict of this between the act and the intention. And there's kind of a formulaic way of judging that. That is, the act is really, really important. We sometimes make a little room uh, for intention to mitigate what's otherwise a, a pretty um, strong violation of a rule. But Eric's comment also invites you to realize that even ethicists may really disagree about whether an act is ethically correct or not, because you heard him mention that consequences are very important. So I just want to share with you that that's something that exists as a problem, not just for you, not all knowing what the consequences are, but it exists in philosophy because you get very different judgments of an action if you say there is a rule and violating the rule is a per se ethical violation, or if the ethical strategy is the consequences should be whatever provides the most good for the greatest number. And they can be in conflict. We need to recognize that, but it's a very important point. A couple of other comments, then we'll go to the next slide. Anyone else that wants to build on what we've been saying? I'm looking and I want to be sure. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Lauren McCoy. Um, I uh, want to echo also what um, Eric. Eric had to say as well. And I think, um, you know, even going into this even earlier is that, you know, the due diligence needs to be done by Dr. C even even before he actually gets there, right? He has to just figure out what those rules are, um, what uh, the needs are, what is the rules that he needs to follow while he's in that country or where he's going. You know, medical licensing has been uh, stepped up in all these countries now because of, I think, all these providers going in uh, just thinking that they can do surgery and not have any consequences that happen. And so there's a lot of licensing that needs to be done prior to, you know, these physicians going in there. Um, and also being able to understand what is happening and what his expectations are when he gets there, but also his expectations of himself and what he can provide to them, you know, what skills he can offer, even if it's an observance of being able just to watch and learn, because a lot of times um, in these countries, uh, they're very creative and they're very, uh, the way that they have their resources are very low, and so they are have to do surgery in a way that you uh, learn a lot from them. So having expectations of going in and learning from them and not you going into, you know, save the day. Uh, scope of practices, what is your scope of practice that you're able to offer them? Because if you don't have something to offer, then you need to stay within that practice and be able to just observe those things. Uh, good intentions, good or bad, like you said, uh, you have to take those um, under consideration of what you're doing because when there are those poor outcomes that you have with those patients, you're ruining that for the next person, provider, group that wants to come in that is affecting what's happening, that they don't want you there or they won't let you come in or they feel like what you have there to offer is not going to be meaningful because of these poor outcomes of patients, uh, physicians working outside of the scope of practice. 
that they have um, and being able to know when you should be doing surgery or not doing surgery is because going in and just observing what's happening in those countries before you feel like you need to go in and do something. You may just be able to observe and have that possibility of knowing, I might not be doing surgery, let me just observe what's happening and maybe I can come back another time and offer services because I've observed what's happening and this is what they need. So just again, and Nate, I'll pause in a minute and ask for your follow-up, but what a lot of excellent points you raised. One of the things that was so interesting in your first part of your comment was the request or the suggestion to someone making a trip to do what you call due diligence. And I, I just underlined that. Before you do operations, you think a lot about competence and what skills you need and what steps need to be done before, during, and after the surgery. That's understood as a requirement for being an ophthalmologist. One of the things that we could think is that it's also important that an ophthalmologist literally every day, but particularly visiting, uh, say, a third world country, do the diligence you describe. And number one, look for the rules. I will just tell you that the AMA has a code of ethics and many rules. And in survey after survey, what we find is that most physicians are not aware of those. So what they're most aware of is what they see. And what we see depends on our peer group. So you've already described that there are physicians, for example, that systematically may violate these rules. But if those are the only physicians that one knows, you might not realize that there were these rules out there. So the first one would be look for the rules. The next one goes back to what Jeff said, I think. The rules don't, all, don't address all of the problems that someone is likely to find. And I think one of the thoughts there is, and you do it in your program systematically, I hope. I think the residents before they're sent are not only made aware of the rules, you have a huge set of resources here of ophthalmologists who have been in those places. So this is kind of an invitation, both to the residents to ask, but to the ophthalmologists who have this experience to share that, including sharing that some of your experiences are actually puzzling. That is sometimes it's very hard to know what the right thing to do is. Again, remember Eric's comment. It depends a lot on how you think about what you're doing, but just the process of thinking about it is really helpful. And I just really encourage that. I think that's part of the development of an excellent clinician as you're being an ophthalmologist. And it's never too late uh, for us to think about those complex problems. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that you incorporated some of what Eric talked about. You talked about knowing the rules, but you also cited some consequences, right? That your behavior may affect at both patient care, which we've heard a lot about, but also even the potential training of subsequent physicians. So a lot of really good points. Nate, uh, any follow-up before we move on from here? That's so what you may have missed the discussion. Uh, I'm channeling my Nate. He agrees wholeheartedly <laughs> with this conversation and would like to call on first uh, Dr. Warner. Yeah. Wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. We heard that. I think one of the um, just the ethical violations that for me, one for me that was most egregious was. Uh, consent, not I don't know if this was really highlighted in prior discussions, but informed consent. And I we've actually had grand rounds about this, about informed consent, what does that mean? And when is somebody truly informed? Um, and I I think that this is a huge issue in outreach in general because um, I think with the uh, cultural differences, the language barriers, to understand truly providing consent to a patient is probably extremely challenging. Um, and I, I mean, it's hard enough to do um, with a, a highly educated uh, person coming to an eye center for cataract surgery to truly have something informed about what they're going to be undergoing and um, have that sort of mind meld of understanding. I can only imagine how treacherous that must be in the early, early of an, an outreach um, camp 
without even bringing in the, the issues of um, coercion. Not coercion um, in a sort of traditional arm bending sense, but in the sense that um, many patients in outreach situations may feel that they have no alternatives. Um, and so they don't have risk benefits and alternatives at all explained. So uh, I think that sort of underlying this uh, whole series of ethical violations is the lack of consent. Because if there's true consent, then the issues of undergoing experimental treatments or undergoing surgery by a, a, a less trained person and not having pre-op evaluation, not having post-op evaluation, that should be covered under informed consent. But I'm not sure that that's really possible. I think that's a really excellent point, and it, it does confront us in, I think, all of our outreach settings. And I think a, another really um, difficult part of that is the expectations culturally and, and legally around informed consent differ quite drastically in the different locations we go. And so do the question of, do you abide by your own and what we have decided here in our medical ethics community, or is it appropriate to abide by what you do in practice there? And that's still a, a, a work in progress constantly because sometimes it might violate our own personal ethics, even though it's not violating the ethics, um, you know, of the context we're working within. Um, and Dr. Tate also had a, a point. Yeah, um, as an observer of several outreach camps, um, I think to say what Jeff was saying, follow up really bothered me. Um, and I was always really concerned about, for example, for me, the cornea transplants that were being done. Um, some of these patients come great distances, you know, I'm, you know, I'm brought by family members and, um, you know, the follow-up for these people, um, that always bothered me because I knew, you know, you know that sutures are gonna pop, sutures have to come out, that can, um, you know, a rejection is gonna happen you know, for them. Transplant, and um, it was a big ethical thing, you know, especially if a patient needed a transplant, perhaps on just one eye. But that follow up of these patients that really was a concern for the outreach camps. Um, and then just what you were saying, like the you know, you know, people, even if Dr. Z's, even if everything was perfect and all his patients were seeing you know, wonderfully after, what he did was wrong. And I just, you know, everything you said was, I, totally with you, but what he did was wrong. And that, you know, if other people say, well, you know, I'm going to, you know, he went and got extra training and, you know, I'm going to do what he did. It just, it's, even if it turned out perfect, he did it just like a bad example. So, just, well, yeah. Can I read one more? Sure. Please, Randy. Yeah. Jean, Jean, I love your points. Thank you. And just to, just to take one step further on what Eric and um, Judith were talking about, right? So we know what informed consent should be. Be, right, according to us. And in another country, it could mean something entirely different, right? Okay, Eric pointed out, which one do you choose? And then layer on top of that, like we really are trying to get away from exploiting the power dynamic, right? Because nearly anything we say and do be potentially just, just taken at face value. And there is this term, and it's a very real term about, you know, this kind of medical or global health colonialism, right? And, and, and that power dynamic is so prevalent, and yet it's informed consent. And perhaps what, what they're doing just does not conform to what we believe is informed consent and this kind of cultural relativity. How do you relativity? How do you engage? If you're a first time guest, like where do you plant your flag on? Well, let's you know what are the things that we're going to exchange in this conversation and build this relationship you know of trust between each other, and yet we may not do anything other than their informed consent for the next five years, just because that's that's the you know that's the situation you're in. So uh, we're going to go to the next slide in a moment, but just to kind of um, give you some added perspective about that, informed consent is actually relatively recent, even in the United States. Correct. So the practice of medicine for most of our history did not include that, and a really good example of that is still going on as attention. If part of informed consent is sharing with people the potential risk of a procedure or a treatment, there are some people who are so frightened by that potential risk that they decline a the procedure. Let me just give an extreme example. 
I think you work in a field where infection and loss of vision are actually quite rare after many of the procedures that you do. Let me just pick a number and say it's one in 500 that there would be a serious consequence, make it loss right, of one in three to 5,000. So, and, and again, it depends on the procedure. Let me use Randy's data and show you how that looks as an issue in informed consent. When you mention the risk of blindness, somewhere there absolutely is a patient for whom that possibility is a reason not to have the procedure. Though they exist, they're, they're relatively common. That patient, if not told of that theoretical risk, is very likely to agree. So think a little bit about what Eric said. If you judge informed consent from the standpoint of consequences, that's a fascinating problem because it's likely that more patients would refuse vision saving surgery than you would have had consequences, right? If you had required informed consent for everyone. So you're actually training in some cases, people denying or giving up the opportunity for improved vision for another value. And again, I think maybe Eric or one of you commented earlier, Modern medical ethics has about four main values. The first on the list, and for many, the first priority is called autonomy. That's actually the value that drives the argument for informed consent. We have decided actually in about the last 50 years that autonomy is more important than some of the consequences, meaning good consequences, that we could get without it. It was the practice that many doctors doing procedures that patients might consider risky or dangerous would either not mention the risk or underweight the risk when they talked about the benefits. We would call that coercion today. That is an unfair disclosure of risks and benefits. 50 so, years ago, that was an ethical discussion. Yes. It was very real for strong. Uh, I mean, I, I was back in the, that period of time. That was not. That was something that, that some of the older people said, you've got a lot of people who aren't going to have something that would save, but almost for sure save their lives and concern them with surgery. <laughs> so it, it's still a discussion. What, what I'm sharing with you, and I think it's really good to think about that in ethics, as well as sort of in the OR, things change. What was right at one point would not be acceptable now. I will just tell you, as an infectious disease physician, with people turning down a vaccine because of a false belief is a challenge in the world of autonomy. Are, are you with me? Mm -hmm. That is, autonomy argues that I remember best interest on your list of rules. The patient says it's in my best interest not to receive this. All of my training tells me that's a wrong decision, which could not only be dangerous to them, but maybe <laughs> to others. Yeah. So uh, just to appreciate the kind of the dynamic here of things changing, but how useful it is to talk about them. Because at the end of the day, what one hopes is that the rules and behaviors that we follow are, are acceptable. They're the product of a lot of careful consideration. And again, global epidemia, uh, ophthalmology is relatively new. So there's a lot of discovery. And some of you asked that this question, which is whose rules do we follow? That is, there are rules in the US, that's where your academy rules are really grounded, but there are both rules and practices in other countries which are very different. Uh, I don't have a facile answer for that for you today, but it's a very important discussion, I think, for you to think about within the program. When you're sending it, one of the nice things about being in a program is you have some control over the behaviors at least that you expect. Whether they will happen or not is another question. But think about Dr. Z a little bit, kind of going to a place in a vacuum, not having been there before and seeing primarily the potential, as one of you said, benefits to themselves. Let's look at the next slide. So actually, I won't spend much time. I'm going to get Nate, if he wants to, to comment, because fortunately, he provided a handout for him. So none of you would leave today without knowledge of those rules. Nate, did you want to highlight any of those rules or make some other comments? Uh, Jay, I think Eric told me you heard my first 
anecdote the introduction. I just want to comment on one other thing. Someone made the comment that there's always a danger of uh, medical colonialism. I'm not sure who that was, but um, I, I totally agree. That's been my experience. What was that? Um, Dr. Petty that mentioned that. Oh, Dr. Petty, and no wonder I agreed with him. Uh, so I, um, I, I've, I've been really cognizant of that um, as I've been working here in Tanzania. Um, oftentimes we'll be seeing patients in clinic and uh, a patient will make the comment that they want the Mzungu doctor to um, do their surgery for them uh, rather than one of my uh, colleagues um, in the department. And it always makes me really uncomfortable when someone makes a comment like that. And I always try to uh, put myself uh, in the position of being the learner. And I explain that I'm, I'm here to learn from um, my colleagues. We're doing a skills exchange and uh, they are much better surgeons than I am uh, when it comes to SICS. Um, but it has made me think a lot about our complex history with colonialism and I, I don't want to do anything that could be misconstrued as neo-colonialism or, or white saviorism. Um, um, and it's, it's easy to fall into those sort of uh, traps, even inadvertently uh, when there's such a, a power dynamic. Um, I know a couple commenters have, have mentioned the power dynamics and the ethical um, dilemmas that those bring. So I think that's a really important part of this discussion. Um, so thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Petty. Um, there are a lot of uh, principles and rules in, on those handouts that we can uh, discuss, uh, but I think, uh, Jay, you wanted to get into some of your broader perspective slides before we close, and we're probably running short on time. So that's exactly right, and I think that the group actually uh, has summarized for me what I would like you to leave with. Uh, a couple of things. One, ethical decisions are complicated. Um, rules are numerous and require what someone called due diligence. Discussion and analysis is probably the best way to deal with them and acknowledge that ethical things, ethical violations that we think we're making make us really uncomfortable. The best way I think to deal with that is to share that with experienced colleagues. And when I come to Moran, that's what I think about. I think about people who have struggled with these problems and frankly, talking to more than one would be a very good idea to find the range of things that people find possible. And the last thing I just wanted to say is special thanks to Nate. This is very challenging to participate, not just remotely, but under the technical challenges that you've got. So many thanks to you for bringing the cases and helping with the discussion. Yeah, I think we're out of time and I would just echo uh, what, what Jay said. Um, uh, we apologize for the technical challenges, but uh, kudos for uh, everybody adapting. And I think it was still an excellent discussion. And uh, thank, you, thank you so much for putting together the, the cases and it uh, engendered a lot of conversation and thought for all of us. So uh, I'll just leave everybody with, um, with kind of a, uh, bringing together what Kalina Jay said and what Jeff said. Is there's, there's a real messiness, uh, not only working internationally, but also in our own spheres um, yeah, where you have to think of all the things that Dr. Z did. You know, there's a, it, it seems so black and white, but imagine it as a rheostat uh, on something that's a spectrum and understanding how you fall within that, uh, those spectrums and uh, how you would navigate where there is maybe a less, a less clear violation, but it's still present or, you know, underlying. And, um, and I think then also realizing that uh, you have to acknowledge the messiness to work and, and to um, find any way to move forward. Um, and I think that's something that is, uh, is as us as uh, in global ophthalmology, but also in society, we're trying to sort out is, okay, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ethical violations and a lot of, um, maybe things haven't been done perfectly, but in that imperfection has come progress, right? You know, the, and, 
finding where that level of due diligence, where uh, that level of intention and consequences, where you fall within that. So you're willing to actually go and do, but still do it in a way that's ethical. So that, you know, that, that um, everything just doesn't remain stagnant. I think that's a really challenge, a big challenge for all of us. Um, I hope it kind of leaves some thoughts and uh, thought of the thought. So thanks, Nathan. Thanks, thanks, Jay. Thank you guys for engaging in the discussion and being fruitful. Thank you. Thank you.